Good evening, brothers and sisters. This is Ed Quiller from the Old Macedonia Baptist Church here to share with you another Bible study. Tonight's Bible study is entitled Restoration. I'd like to start off tonight's lesson with a quote. Um, and this is a very little known quote, but a very powerful quote. And the quote reads as follows. It says, my memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great savior, end quote. Now, this was written by a gentleman by the name of John Newton. And John Newton, uh, some of you may be familiar, but John Newton was the gentleman who wrote the famous hymn, Amazing Grace. But you got to understand something about John Newton. John Newton was a wild boy. Before he got saved, like several of us were, uh, John was actually a pirate and he was actually a slave trader. But he came to know the Lord and he came to know the Lord to the degree that when he was older, he got to a point where he said, hey, there's a lot of things I don't remember, but I still remember two things. I remember that I am a great sinner and I remember that Christ is a great savior. And that's a powerful powerful word and reminder for us today as well tonight's lesson again is entitled restoration we're going to come back to this theme but before we get into scripture uh, let's talk about a couple of things here one the more you walk with the lord the more you walk with him the longer you stay in there with the lord the more you should be aware or the more he will make you aware of your own shortcomings and the and the wickedness of your own heart and your propensity to sin. I know oftentimes television and even some phony Christians will make it appear like the more you walk with the Lord, the more you just walking up the smooth side of the mountain and the more you just continually have it together. But the truth of the matter is the more you walk with the Lord, if you real, the more you walk with him and the closer you get with him, the more he's going to show you about yourself. And the more you become aware of your own wickedness and your own shortcomings and your own propensity to sin. That's the first thing I want you to understand. The second thing I want you to understand is this. Even the strongest, most prominent men and women of God are susceptible to sin, weakness and failure. And you should take heed lest you fall. That's important enough for me to, to spend just a little bit of time there because Again, as I alluded to in, in the first point that I made, the more you walk with him, the more he's going to show you you. And the more he shows you you, the more you're like, I can't believe all of that stuff was in my heart. But make sure that you remind yourself that even if you are walking in a period of time with the Lord where things are just going well for you, be reminded that even the strongest, most prominent saints of God. Are, are always susceptible to sin, weakness, and failure, you are still encased in a flesh suit. And none of us are perfect. So again, as we discuss tonight's lesson, which is rest restoration, these are points that I want you to remember. Nobody is beyond failure. It doesn't matter how much makeup you put on. It, it doesn't matter how many fronts that you put up in front of people. Nobody is beyond failure. And the more you walk with him, the more that you will be made aware of your own weaknesses, the, the wickedness that's in your own heart and your own propensity to sin. And lastly, the fact is, listen, every single one of us, every single man or woman or of God will be in need of restoration at some point. Every single one of us. You, me, and everybody that you know will be in need of restoration at some point. Restoration from two primary perspectives. One, restoration in our relationship and or our walk with God. You can pretty much connect the dots on that because, quite frankly, sin separates us from God. And whenever there is sin that's in and around our lives, that sin must be dealt with. Therefore, uh, through forgiveness and repentance uh, or repentance and then forgiveness. Rather, what you'll find is that the Lord will restore 
our relationship with him. And then secondly, you may be in need of restoration in your relationships with others. Now, tonight's lesson will not focus on restoration in your relationships with others. But because it's not and because we're getting ready to break into the meat of the lesson, I'll just simply say it is important as believers that we are just as adamant about restoration in our relationships with others whenever relationships have been strained whenever sin has come in and has caused some damage we should just we should be just as serious about that as we are about our uh, restoration of our relationship with God in fact you know there's scripture that tells us that if you are standing in the temple and you are praying and you remember that you have an ought against your brother put down your sacrifice Hold a minute with that and go and make that right with your brother. Then come back to the temple and continue on in your worship of, of the Lord. I say that very briefly because it's, it's important, men and women of God, that we don't allow broken relationships to remain in our lives. And I know how terribly difficult that is. And I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking to myself on this. I know how difficult that is, but we cannot allow strained or broken relationships to stand in our lives especially because there's an unwillingness to forgive others there's an unwillingness to show grace there's an unwillingness to show mercy those same things that we seek from the lord so tonight's lesson isn't about that but i thought i'd throw that in but just be reminded of these three key things before we break into scripture and i'm going to give you three separate scriptures and then i'm gonna go ahead and get out of your way but be reminded of these things. One, listen, the more you walk with him, the more you're going to see about yourself. It's almost like you were in a completely dark room and the more you walk with the Lord, the lights continually or gradually rather come on and you begin to see all of the spots and stains on yourself the more you walk with him. Number two, anyone can sin. Even the strongest, most prominent saints are susceptible to sin, weakness and failure. And we should take heed unless we fall we should never take a position or or, or uh, we should never give ourselves a, give ourselves over to the opinion that somehow we are better than somebody else because they failed and we didn't or they fell in a way that we didn't i should say every one of us are susceptible to sin nobody is exempt from that and then lastly because of that fact every one of us will be in the need of restoration at some point particularly the restoration in our relationship with God. Now, let's let me give you a definition here. Restoration by definition. If you were to go and you were to look this up by definition, you would find the following. Restoration is the act of restoring, renewal, revival or reestablishment. Another way of defining it is to say it's the state or fact of being restored. And another last one is to return something to its former original normal or unimpaired condition so to restore something is to renew it is to revive it is to reestablish it and as i mentioned a couple of slides ago every single one of us will be in need of that you will be in need of restoration if you walk with the lord and if you live on this earth you will be in need of restoration and so there will by definition be a point in time where you will need to be revived you will need to be renewed. You will need to be reestablished. None of us are perfect. You will be in need of this. So let's let's jump into some scripture and let me show you a couple of things and then I'll give you a couple of points and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Turning your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 and we're going to go over to uh, verse number 31 and we'll read all the way down through Verse number 34. Now, we're actually going to start off uh, with an example of a very prominent man of God. Uh, in a moment of failure, he fails. Let's look and see what scripture says. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 34. And the word of God reads, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, and that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. Verse 34. 
And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day. Before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Thus ends the reading of God's word as found at Luke chapter 22 verses 31 through 34. Now again tonight's lesson is restoration. And there's a reason why I've decided to start with this scripture. Let me give you some context of what you just saw here. So Jesus had been speaking to his disciples. And. If you go up a little bit further in scripture, you'll find that the disciples have been arguing about themselves, about who was going to be the greatest. And, and, and many of us know that Peter was considered to be the leader of the disciples. He was considered to be the most boisterous of those, the most vocal of those. And, you know, uh, Jesus had been telling them what, what the greatest in this kingdom would look like and so on and so forth. And anyways, to speed the story alone, he's now talking to Simon. Peter and he's telling him he's saying Peter uh, let me tell you something Satan has asked he has desired to sift you like wheat but I pray for you that your faith won't fail and when you are converted I want you to strengthen your brethren so what Jesus is telling him is he's look Satan has come and Satan has asked for permission to try you he's asked for permission to sift you like wheat and we can deduct that God had given Satan the permission to try Peter because look at what Jesus said. Jesus said, but I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail and that when you're converted that you will strengthen your brothers. That's what I want from you, Peter. So now here's what we can deduct from that. So Satan had obviously had to come and ask permission. Can I try him? I want to try him. I want to try him. And and Jesus didn't say to Peter, but I told Satan, no, look at it. Jesus didn't say, no, I, I told Satan, no. Jesus said, but I prayed for you. And I prayed that your faith wouldn't fail. And I prayed that when you are converted, that you will then go and strengthen your brethren. And now and now look at the look at the rest of what happened in Scripture. This is this is good that we have an opportunity to look back at this. But. Look at what Peter said to Jesus. Now, Jesus was just giving Peter a warning. You know, I wish there were times in my life that Jesus would come directly to me and say, now, Ed, you need to get ready. Because because Satan has come and he, he wants to try you in this way and he wants to bring this problem in your life and he wants to do X and Y and Z. But he's never done that for me. But he, he did this for Peter. And this is what Peter said. This is what Peter said to Jesus. Peter said, what? I'm ready to go with you all the way. You go to prison, I'm going to prison. You're going to die, I'm going to die. And then Jesus looked at Peter and said, now, Peter, now, hold a minute now, Peter. Before the cock crow three times, you're going to deny that you even know me. And that's where we ended the scripture. Now, go with me now. Just follow me. We're discussing restoration. Let me tell you the rest of the story. So the rest of the story goes that exactly what Jesus said happened, happened. Um, Peter was following Jesus as Jesus had been apprehended by the authorities and a servant girl came up to Peter and said, now you look familiar. Uh-huh. Yeah. You look just like one of them that was with Jesus. And then, you know, uh, Peter ultimately began cursing and said, Hey, you know, I don't, I don't even know him. And the cock crowed three times as Jesus said, and then, and then Peter remembered the words of Jesus. And if you look in the account that's written in the book of Luke, Luke says that Jesus looked at Peter and then Peter began, he began to realize the error of his ways and he wept bitterly and he left. Well, anyways, after Jesus was resurrected, Peter was restored. And what Jesus was referring to in verse number 32, you see the effects of Jesus's prayer for Peter. Because he says, I pray for you and I pray that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, strengthen thy brethren and go on into the book of Acts and you'll see what Peter did. But the point is, here was a strong man of God. Failing. Let's look at some more scripture. In verse number 54. It says, then they took him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were 
sat down together. Peter sat down among them, but a certain maid beheld him, and as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him, and he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a while, while another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour, after another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow was also with him, for he is also a Galilean. Verse 60, And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, and how he had said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Exactly what I said happened. Now, here's the point that I want to move on. Uh, I want you to keep in your mind before I move on from this and go on to the next set of scripture. And, and then we'll tie this back up into restoration. This, I intend to not be an extremely long lesson. So I want you to, I want you to look at something that happened here lastly. So we, we talked about what Peter did and what Jesus said. But I want to talk about another thing that Jesus did. And that Peter said, but from a different perspective. Now, I want you to look at the difference between the two confessions. I'll catch that. I want you to look at the difference between the two confessions. Go back and read this. And when you go back and read, what you'll find is you'll find that Jesus had a faithful confession under pressure. Jesus was standing in front the most powerful authorities religious authorities at that time and as he was under that pressure and as they had been hitting him and spitting on him and insulting him they asked him a question are you the christ and jesus stood and gave a faithful confession and said i am he you said it now on the flip side of that let's look at peter's confession so now here was jesus making a confession in front of the most powerful authorities that there were at that time. And yet whenever Peter had to make his confession in front of a servant girl. He confessed that he didn't even know Jesus. This same Peter that if you go back a little bit in scripture, you'll find that it was Peter that confessed. He was the first disciple on record to say that Jesus was Christ. Go back and look at it and you'll see this. I want you to understand the depths of the failure here now. This was that man. This was the only man that could say that he walked on water. It was only a couple steps, but he did it. This was the man that whenever the other quote, you can't see me doing air quotes, but the other quote disciples that were around Jesus. Remember, there were just 12 disciples. There were 12 apostles. But there were many people that were around Jesus. And there was a point in time whenever Jesus had began preaching something that wasn't palatable to their ears and they began to leave Jesus. Jesus asked a question because the 12 remain and Jesus asked a question to, to the 12. He said, y'all going to leave, too. If you remember, it was Peter that said, Lord, where can we go? You are the Christ. We have nowhere else to go but unto you. I want you to understand this was that guy. So out of the same mouth from the same guy that had confessed that same thing about Jesus before. Now look at the variations in the confessions at this moment. Jesus in front of the most powerful authorities, faithful confession. Peter in front of a servant girl. False confession. So man, when he went out and he wept bitterly, he realized what he had done. He had denied the one that he recognized to be the very Christ. He is a powerful man of God, a leader among God's people, a follower of Christ in many ways, just like you and I. But look at how he's fallen. Let's go to scripture. Let me give you some more scripture. Turning your Bible to Luke chapter 15. Several of you will be very, very familiar with this scripture. Very, very familiar with this parable. But I, I want to show you something. This is Jesus is speaking. So if you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15, starting from verse number 11, you'll find that the letters that are written here are, are in red because 
the overwhelming majority of these are Jesus speaking directly. This is the parable of the prodigal son. Now, remember, we're, again, we're talking about restoration. We said in the very beginning that, you know what, every one of us at some point will be in need of a restoration, restoration from two points, primarily in our relationship and our walks with the Lord. And then secondarily, we will also be in, rest in need of restoration in our relationships with others. That's another lesson for another day. But let's see some scripture and let's see what Jesus, Jesus's perspective on on restoration is. Let's go from Luke chapter 15, verse number 11. And the word of God reads, and this is from the King James Version. It reads as follows. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of my goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Verse 17. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. Verse number 18. Now look at this. This is powerful. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. And when he was yet away off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Verse number 21. And the son said unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry verse 25 now his eldest son was in the field and as he came and drew nigh to the house he heard music and dancing and he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant and he said unto him thy brother is come and thy father has killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound and he was angry and would not go in therefore his father came out and entreated him verse 29 and he answering said unto his father, Lo, these many years I do serve thee, neither transgress I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Verse number 32, it was meet or it was suitable that we should make merry and be glad for this. Thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Thus ends the reading of God's word as found at Luke chapter 15 verses 11 through 32. And once again, I read the King James Version for you. Now, we've been talking about restoration. And we started off talking or reflecting upon Peter's failure. Now, what I didn't do is I didn't go in and outline for you um, what ended up happening specifically in the book of Acts and how Peter was ultimately the one that uh, led the, the establishment of the church. And then obviously several others helped out with that, including Paul and Barnabas and many, many others. But I digress. Here we find ourselves in Luke chapter 15, verse number 11. And this is the story or the account, rather, of the parable of, of, of the prodigal son. And there's a couple of points 
that I think are important for us to get. Let me say firstly, when you look, this is a very familiar passage of scripture, and there's a lot that you can miss over if uh, or gloss over if, if you're not paying attention. So firstly, there's a couple of things that I want you to get. One, Jesus was given this parable or this story of this these two sons. There was two sons and there was the father. The younger son, which in those days wasn't necessarily entitled to anything. But the younger son was coming to the father and saying to the father, hey, listen, I want you to give me my half, man. Let me get mine and 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 and, and I, I want to get my inheritance now because I want to go and do my thing with that. Well, you have to understand what that was indicative of or what that represented back in those days. Uh, he was essentially, for all intents and purposes, he was, you knew, he knew that you, you didn't get your inheritance until after the father was dead. So it was almost akin to saying, man, drop dead, give me mine, let me get away from you. And that's precisely what, um, what he ended up doing. The father ended up giving him his portion of the inheritance and he took his inheritance. And, and the word of God says that he went to a country of far off. And what that is indicative or symbolic of is that he went far away from the father. He went he went far away, not just in distance, but he went far away in heart and in mind from the father. And the word of God tells us what happens. And I won't belabor the point, but we know what happened. He he went and he spent all his money with prostitutes and with riotous living. And when he had run through all of his money and, and life had begun to turn on him and the party was over and the lights was off and everybody was gone. He found himself in the pig style of life. He found himself in a position that no Jewish man would really ever find themselves in or certainly would never want to find themselves in. He found himself having to be hired out as a hand or as one that worked with pigs. Jewish people had nothing to do with pigs. They find them disgusting. Yes, I know. I mean, I love bacon. I don't understand. But, you know, that's that's what they think about. Them. They find them disgusting and a Jewish man would never have anything to do with a pig. But that's, that shows you how sin works. See, sin will take you in places. That you and that you never intended to go, sin will, will end you up in a spot that you never intended on being in. And here now, this younger son finds himself in a pig sty, feeding pigs, and it is at that moment in verse number seventeen and eighteen something miraculous happens, which is the key to restoration, because that's what we're referring to tonight. In verse number seventeen and eighteen, it says first that he came to himself, but in verse number eighteen is the powerful verse. Because in verse number 18 is when he says, I'm going to go back to my father. And I'm going to go back to him. And I'm paraphrasing. And I'm going to admit that I had it wrong. And I'm going to admit that I sinned against him. And I've come to the realization that I'm not worthy. And I'm going to go. And then the next verse, I believe is in verse number 20, is the, the next much more powerful thing that happened. In verse number 20, it says, and he arose. So not only did he think it, not only did he come to that realization, but he followed through on that. And he started heading back to his father anyways. In verse number 21, you'll find that the, the son makes it back. Um, but before he made it back, the word of God shows us prior to verse number 21 that the the father recognized him afar off and and i've mentioned this in bible studies before the, the beauty of that whole statement is that one there's two things that we can draw from that that the father was expecting him he was looking he was watching he was waiting but the most important thing is he recognized him afar off and the father ran to meet him showing us that the son hadn't even made it all the way back to where he needed to be yet which is a powerful lesson for us many of us think that you know, we got to get it all together before we head back to the father. But the scripture shows us that that's not the case. And so anyways, in verse number 21, he gets to the father and he begins to confess his sin to the father. And you know the rest of the story. You saw it. I won't take you through every step. But starting from verse number 22, you begin to see that the father begins to restore him to his previous position. Because it says that the father said to his servant, bring out the best robes. Now, the father in scripture, it shows us that the father didn't even address what the son had said. The son said, you know what? I, I sinned against you. I ain't even worthy." that the father didn't even address that. 
he said to his servants, bring out the best robe. And then they put a robe on him and then put a ring on his finger. And the ring was oftentimes symbolic of being a member of a certain family. So it was symbolic of him being restored to his position in the family. And then he said, put shoes on his feet. And he put shoes on his feet. Obviously, the guy was barefoot. And then it says, bring out the fatted calf. But there's another point that's not here explicitly, that, that, that's there implicitly. And I want to call it out so that you see it. Now, remember, this son was in the pig style of life. Remember that he had been working as a hired hand, um, uh, helping out pigs, which is something that a Jewish man wouldn't do. This guy had to be stinking. He had to be covered in filth. He had to be in a state, you know, and you can see it for yourself. He didn't have on a rope. He didn't have on a ring. He didn't have, even have shoes on his feet. When he left, he was full when he went out. When he left, he was balling. He had a sack full of cash whenever he left. Shoes on his feet, robe on his back, ring on his finger, looking good and smelling good. But now he comes back to the father and he's covered in filth. He's been walling around in the world and now he's covered in the filth of the world. But instead of looking at that son with disdain instead of looking at that son and noticing the filth that he's covered in he looked past the filth and he saw his son he looked past the filth and he saw the one that he had been waiting to return to him he looked past the stink of sin he looked past the disappointment of what his son had done. He looked past the foolishness. Of his son's error. He didn't even listen to. The words that came out of his son's mouth. About being unworthy. He just saw. His son. And there's a lesson in that for us. There's a powerful lesson. In that for us. Because the father that's in this story represents our father and the son that's in this story the younger son rather represents many of us every single one of us have sin every single one of us has a stink of sin in the world on us at some point in time but now as i as i draw to a close let's look at some of the themes that this in the previous scripture are showing us and then let's wrap this up so what is scripture showing us here of all of these things and what's it got to do with restoration now remember the definition of restoration is the act of something being restored to its original state to its original unimpaired state the act of being renewed the act of being revived what is the scripture showing us as it relates to restoration and why is this important to us as believers what's this got to do with the fact that every single one of us will be in need of restoration at some point uh what does this got to do with anything well let me give you the first point the first point is this sometimes we fail badly these scriptures that we've shown the scripture with with with, with peter denying christ uh the scripture that outlines the prodigal son and the parable of of what he did and what the father did these show us that there are times that we fail and sometimes we fail badly and the second point that i want to give you to this is that spiritual failure is often a slow leak and what i mean by that is and you need to catch that because it's some good stuff spiritual failure is often a slow leak It's more times a slow leak than it is a blowout see many times people will see a person uh or a man or woman of god that has fallen in there and it seems to them like it's a blowout like they were just riding right along and they were going on at 65 miles an hour and everything was good. And then all of a sudden they blew out. No, spiritual failure more often times than not is a slow leap. It oftentimes starts with your prayer life. It oftentimes starts with your study life. You know, you're not praying as you once were. You're not studying as you once were. There's things that you begin to tolerate that you never would before. There's things that form in your mind first before they actually ever become any type of action or something that forms in your heart sometimes it might be a grudge or something like that that de develops in your heart and you hold it in your heart the point is we fail badly sometimes and that bad failure is oftentimes the result of a slow leak in our spiritual tires 
and, and, and not so much a blowout. So scripture is showing us very, very plainly that it can happen to any one of us. It happened to Peter. Now, we didn't we didn't go into David's failure with Bathsheba, but it happened to him. And there's many, 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 many more instances. But the truth of the matter is we all fail in one manner or another. And therefore, we'll be in need of restoration of our walks and relationship with the Lord. Spiritual failure is often a slow leap. And you need to be aware of that, because if you're not, you won't know to look for the slow leap. Now, what scripture also shows us, the scripture also shows us that restoration is often preceded preceded by repentance and forgiveness if you go back to the story or, or the parable of the prodigal son you will see that he was ultimately restored the father who was representative of, of god ultimately restored the son who was representative of those who have transgressed the father in one way or another but restoration is preceded by percent by repentance and forgiveness going back to verse number 17 of chapter 22 of Luke you will find that the first thing that needed to happen and this is what I need to stress to you tonight restoration is available and the father just like the father in the parable of the, the prodigal son is eagerly awaiting us to come and us to be restored unto him but it is preceded by repentance and forgiveness you have to repent if you're walking in your walk with the Lord and you're walking what it used to be, look over your life. Where do you need to repent? If you're walking with the Lord and you're further from him than you ever be, may, may, ever have been, maybe you're like that son that's in the story of the prodigal son. And maybe you went off to a faraway country. Maybe you just got tired of God. or Maybe you just got tired of doing what's right. Or maybe you just got tired of people taking advantage of your kindness or whatever the situation may be. But. The first thing that needs to happen is what happened in verses number 17 and 18 with that son. We have to repent. And I want to be clear here. Repentance is, I want you to imagine that if you were traveling and you were traveling southbound on I-20, repentance is turning and going northbound. You can't go in two directions at the same time. And I don't know what your circumstances are. I don't know what your situation is. It ain't my business. But the reality of the matter is Restoration is readily available and it's preceded by repentance and forgiveness. Forgiveness is available. Confess it, man. Look over your life. If you need to be restored in your walk, take heart in the fact that it's not, I mean, it's not just you. You're not the only one. Everybody is susceptible to failure. Everybody is susceptible to weakness. We all fail and sometimes we fail badly. Spiritual failure, like I mentioned a minute ago, is it's a slow leap. You know, it may seem like it's a one time event. But if you go back and you do an autopsy, if you will, on the situation, you'll find that, you know, there were several things that went awry in your walk. But take heart. Restoration is available. And in regards to repentance, I want to tell you the Christian life begins with repentance and faith. That's how we become a Christian. It begins with repentance and it begins with the confession of faith in Jesus Christ. But it also continues on with repentance and faith on a daily basis. Listen, you, you have to resolve yourself to the reality that you're going to be you're going to need to be restored daily. You're going to need to be renewed daily. You're going to need to be revived daily. And so therefore, you are going to need to repent daily. Look back on your life, man. You know when you went through the day to day and you cussed them people out. You knew what you was doing when you cussed them people out. Don't you lay your head on that bed tonight and cuss those people out without making that right. Confess it. Repent of it. Ask the Lord to help you to do better in it. Look back over your life every day. Scripture is telling us very clearly that we all fail. Scripture is telling us very clearly that restoration is available to all of us because of what Jesus the Christ did. But listen, brothers and sisters, we have to repent. And we have to receive forgiveness. Now, that works in another way as well. You have to be willing to forgive. I told you a different lesson for a different day. 
Restoration is often needed in two different ways. One in our walks with God and in our relationships with others. Different lesson for a different day. But restoration is preceded by repentance and forgiveness. Scripture has also shown us that grace is available. It is available for those who have failed. It was available for David. It was available for Peter. It's available to you. And if you turn back to him, he will abundantly pardon and restore you to fellowship with him and to service in his cause. Back to the prodigal son. The prodigal son, had, remember, he had came up with a little speech when he had said to himself, I'm going to go and tell my father, don't even make me a son. You know, just let me be a servant. I, I don't I don't even don't count me as family anymore. Just let me be a hang around. But if you look at what the father did, he didn't even entertain that foolishness. He restored him back to sonship, back to fellowship and back to service. He was a member of the house when he put a ring on his finger. That was symbolic of making him restoring him back into the family. And God will do the same thing for you. There's nothing that you've done that's made you beyond his restoration. It, nothing, man. It, it doesn't matter what you've done. I don't know what you've done. You might listen. You might be fresh off of sinning when you pop when you jumped on this uh, lesson tonight. You might be fresh from sinning. I don't know. But I can tell you this, there's nothing that you've done that puts you beyond his ability to pardon and restore you if you are willing to repent of it. And the last point I want to make to you is to I want to bring you back to uh, the point that I started off with, the quote that I started off with. Now, remember the quote. Uh, it was by Mr. Newton who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. He said, hey, he, and he was getting older and he's like, I don't remember a lot, but I remember two things. I remember that I'm a great sinner. And I remember that Jesus is a great savior. And, and I want to I want to call leave you with this this statement. You are a great sinner as well. Yes, you are. Yeah, you are. You are, you are a great sinner as well. But Jesus is a great savior. Isn't it amazing to think about that whenever he was on that cross, that that he was dying for all sin. All A -A -L, in its entirety, every sin. He was dying for. He knew about it. He knew where your shortcomings would be. He knew where your failures would be. He was aware of those. You are a great sinner. Your sin debt is a whole lot more than you would ever be able to pay. But Jesus is a great savior. Restoration is very simple. We don't do the restoring because we can't. We only do the repenting. We do the turning. We do the humility that's required for us to recognize our own sin. We are the ones that are required to look over our own lives. Every single person will be in need of restoration. It's not just you. And if you happen to be a super Christian today, if you happen to be one that uh, has never sinned and you got it all together, well, God bless you. I'm talking to everybody else. Everybody else, restoration is available. Don't let condemnation sit on you to the point where you believe you begin to believe that you are beyond God's ability to restore you because you are not. Lastly, I leave you with two scriptures and they essentially say the same thing. I want you to check these two scriptures out for yourself. Then Luke chapter 15, both of them. Uh, and if you look at this, you'll find that Jesus was given these two separate parables, the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin before he gave the parable of the uh, prodigal son. But I, I simply want to give you the scripture. Look at what he says. Jesus said this in Luke 15, chapter number seven. He says this. He says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. That's in verse number seven of Luke chapter 15. And then in Luke 15, verse number 10, after the next parable, he says in verse number 10, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And you know what? Those are what I like to refer to as hallelujah scriptures because they bring some real, real great news to us today. 
it says that there's joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Remember I told you that repentance and faith is obviously the initial stages of our Christian walk. But repentance and faith is something that we continually do every day. Now, if you tie those two points in together and you tie that into the scripture, heaven is celebrating over the fact that we are willing to repent of our sins daily. There's joy in heaven over the repentance, over the one sinner that repented more than over the 99 just persons. Now, in this particular parable, he was talking about a lost sheep. Yes, I know that. I understand that. And in that second parable, he was talking about a lost coin. But the theme is still applicable to you and to I. Listen, every one of us have done something that is not right in the eyes of the Lord. You probably you're going to do some more, too. But the truth is, don't get comfortable in sin. Don't get comfortable in error. Make sure that you make it a part of your everyday life to have a heart and a mind of repentance. Look over yourself. Don't be arrogant enough to think that. You know what? You've got it together. Listen, you won't have it together until you make it to the other side. You have it together then. But until then, you do not have it together. Make sure you have a heart of repentance because restoration in your walk with the Lord is available. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you've given us an opportunity to hear your word. and We thank you, Lord, just for your word. We thank you, God, that restoration is available. We thank you, God, that you won't to restore us you want to renew us you want to revive us in our walks with you we thank you for it god because that's precisely what we need lord we are so imperfect in so many ways we get it so wrong so many times god we've sinned against you in so many ways and we confess those things to you we just ask god that you forgive us and we pray father that you forgive us and lord you place our feet on solid footing and we ask god that you restore us Restore us in our walks, God. There are people, these are your people that need restoration right now. There are some, Lord, that may be listening even now. Lord, they feel so far away from you, God. They feel like the son in the prodigal son story, Lord, that's all far away from you. But, God, I know that you can bring them back. I know that you are a God of restoration. I know that you are a God of forgiveness. And, Father, we seek that forgiveness and we seek that restoration right now in Jesus' name. I pray for them now. I pray, Lord, that you convict the hearts and minds of these, your people, Lord, in the areas that we need to be convicted in. Lord, let us be mindful of the fact that you are good, and, but that you are a holy God and that you require of us to walk in holiness and righteousness. God, give us the strength to do that. We can't do it by ourselves. Lord, we need you. So we pray for it now in Jesus' name. I pray for them now in Jesus' name. I pray, God, that where walks have been broken, where fellowship has been broken with you, Lord, that you restore that right now. I pray, Father, that you draw your, your, your children back to you, God, and let them know, Lord, that you are waiting to run to them just like the father ran to the son and the prodigal son, God. You are just waiting for us to come back to you. So, Father, I pray that you got them back to you in Jesus' name. Encourage your people now, Lord, wherever they stand. Encourage them, Lord, in whatever they are dealing with. Lord, there's some circumstances that are far too big for us to deal with on our own. But with you, God, we can do anything. So we thank you for it now. And I pray, Lord, that if it's, if it's your will that you keep us in your care and that your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.